Okay, I think now we can start. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Konstantin Jomolensky and in the name of Dynamesh, I welcome you to our webinar session today on the parastomal hernia repair. Um, first, some, some housekeeping rules. Um, please be aware today's session is being recorded. And um, as for questions during the seminar, feel free to write any questions into the chat. Uh, we will go through these at the end of this seminar. Um, if there are any urgent questions for understanding or so, feel free to raise your hand at any point. I can then activate your mic um, and you can address your question directly to Professor Berger. Which leads me to the next point. I'm very happy to, to um, have Professor Dr. Dieter Berger here, um, one of, if not the absolute top expert on parastomal hernias in Germany, uh, the inventor of the sandwich technique for the parastomal hernia repair, um, the and previous president of the German Hernia Society. And so without further ado, I think I can directly hand over the word to Professor Berger, who will start his presentation. I think we already have a raised hand. <laughs> Thank see. you, Konstantin. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, I also would like to welcome all of you for this webinar about the parastomal hernia repair. In fact, I am not the best expert overall, not at all. I'm only very interested in parastomal hernia repair since a long time because I saw so much patience and I saw so much problems after surgery um, which suffers these, play, these patients. First of all, what I would like to introduce today is uh, nothing about the incidents, almost nothing about the incidents, because there is no discussion. Parastomal hernia is really a frequent problem. Then I would uh, point out some um, new results about the pathogenesis and also risk factors. Um, the diagnosis is also quite important, especially if you want to perform any, um, any kind of studies. Uh, with parastomal hernias. Another question when we talk about hernia in general is the question whether a patient really need uh, any kind of surgery and which patient does really need surgery. I will show you some uh, surgical techniques and, uh, and at the end I will also talk about uh, some difficult cases um, which are not suitable for only one technique. And this is not the topic today. I would like nevertheless to point out that uh, the prophylaxis is better than therapy. And this is proven today. First of all, the incidents for exactly 40 years ago in the textbook of surgery, uh, Golliger wrote that the um, the parastomal hernia is virtually inevitable. And it's, it's nothing to say about the incidence anymore. Concerning the pathogenesis, this is a very, uh, very recent paper of uh, the last year from uh, China. They studied primary cultures of the skin fibroblasts of patients with a stoma and patient without uh, parastomal hernia and, pay, and compare these results with the patients with a parastomal hernia. And what they clearly found was similar to the uh, pathogenesis of incisional hernia, they found an increased expression of procollagen 3, suppressed viability and also mobility of the fibroblasts. The matrix metalloproteinases are the expression of the matrix uh, metalloproteinases are uh, changed as well as the inhibitors of these proteases and the collagen 3 itself. And that's almost the same or really similar to the uh, pathogenesis of incisional hernia. So one fact is that the parastomal hernia represents as well as the incisional hernia 
uh, and college, collagen disease. But furthermore, there are some risk factors for parastomal hernias. Also in the last year, uh, uh, a, a group studied the trefline diameter and found that the diameter increases over time from 20 millimeter to 30 and 40 millimeters. In female patients, the uh, diameter increases more than in male patients. And the cumulative incidence of parastomal hernia increases with increasing trefin di diameter. Another point, and this seems quite important, was described in 2014 by a group from the Netherlands, as well as this year by a, a Japanese group. They looked for the, um, for the rectus muscle by computed tomography and found an atrophy of the medial part of the rectus muscle, medial of the, um, of the stoma, uh, of the stoma um, and caudal of, of the stoma as well. And Timmermans described additionally a midline shift to the opposite side. So the uh, stoma, the, the creation of the stoma itself changes the rectus muscle and may be res responsible or may be one factor which is, um, which is inducing the parastomal hernia at the end. The BMI has also been again recently shown in a very big uh, study with 7,600 patients with an ostomy and BMI was in this big uh, uh, in this big group of patients in this large group of patients the only independent risk factor for the uh, BSH development. It should also be kept in mind that if you use laparoscopy when uh, creating a stoma you will produce more parastomal hernia than in open procedures especially if you uh, have a, car, um, a patient with erectile cancer and you remove your specimen by the stoma side. This is a big problem. You should use an, an, a, different, um, a different side for extracting the specimen. Then you can, uh, yeah, then you can a little bit reduce the frequency of the parastomal hernia. Another point which is really very, very important was very nicely pointed out by Palmer that every kind of uh, stoma complication of early and also late stoma complication correlates with the lack of preoperative marking the, uh, the stoma site. And therefore, it's almost in almost all cases, it's possible to mark the stoma site preoperatively, but the doctors must be able to do that by themselves because during night, the stoma nurses usually are not available for preoperative marking. Another quite old paper described the intra-abdominal obesity as a risk factor. They uh, showed that the waist circumference of more than 100 centimeters was an uh, important risk factor for the development of parastomal hernia. So pathogenesis can be summarized as a, a parastomal hernia is a, a collagen disease, but there are also some other risk factors which should be kept in mind and sometimes can be changed very often. If we talk about surgery, this paper seems to be quite important. It's three, year, three years old from the Netherlands. They looked on 80 patients, 42 with surgical repair, the remaining uh, 38 non-operative patients. They had in the 42 patients, 23 recurrences. 21 of them needed further surgical repair. In the watchful waiting group, eight patients needed finally surgical repair. There was one emergency repair. So 
the um, office concluded that non-operative treatment might be, might be a better choice because the results of the repair are so bad that um, non-surgical um, observation might be better. That's all, that's today, well, I called it modern disaster of parastomal hernia repair. Is there anything, any place for watchful waiting? The European uh, Hernia Society found no evidence about the benefit of watchful waiting versus surgery, and therefore they could not recommend any uh, behavior because there is no evidence what to do with patients with parastomal hernia. However, this is, uh, um, this is a, a publication from the Danish hernia registry, seven years old, which was quite impressive because they showed 32% reoperation after a surgical repair of parastomal hernia. They found a 6.3% mortality in these patient group. And the strongest risk factor, the only risk factor for reoperation or death is the fact of the emergency operation. And it enhances the risk by the factor of almost eight. So there it should be it should be kept in mind that if you have an emergency case, then you have a very great risk for the patient to get any complication or to even die. The quality of life is another point which is correlated uh, to, to the indication of surgical repair. And these authors from Scandinavia looked for a lot of patients with uh, stoma and without stoma after rectal cancer. They used some, um, some uh, quality of life scores. And at the end, what you can see is that if you have a patient without a stoma and a patient with a stoma, you have in almost all these parameters a more or less significant decrease of the quality of life. The line is the reference population. But what is even more important is that 31% of the patients with a, para, with a stoma develop the parastomal, parastomal bulging. Almost 12% of these patients had a surgical repair and half of them comparable to the Netherlands group, reported recurrent bulging. And if you compare patients, uh, stoma patients with and without bulging, the, the patient with bulging had uh, different body-related parameters. They had reduced parameters of sectional functioning as well as social functioning and pain is even more pronounced in patients with a parastomal bulging. So if you have a patient with a stoma, these patients may have reduced quality of life. And if you have a parastomal hernia uh, in, in, in a patient with a stoma, you have an even more pronounced uh, decrease of the quality of life. And this may, um, may be a fact that underlines the necessity of a safe repair of a parastomal hernia. Concerning the diagnosis, of course, uh, in, main, in most cases, the parastomal hernia can be diagnosed um, clinically, but if you do a study and if you look on uh, the results with prophylactic meshes, it has been absolutely clear that the clinical examination is not the is not in all in all cases really um, or reveals an exact result. And this uh, Netherlands group they looked for 19 studies comparing computed tomography with the clinical examination, and uh, for further studies compared ultrasound with clinical examination. In summary. Um, uh, 
four or five studies of these uh, compare com of these studies comparing CT with clinical examination showed an increase of the hernia incidence by using computed tomography. The disagreement between CT and clinical ex examination may be sometimes high, and in that context, um, I would like to um, I would like to uh, point out on another study from the United States about six years ago, and they looked for the CT scan, which was um, which was um, looked by a radiologist and also by a surgeon, and they concluded that the gold standard of looking on a CT scan can only be produced by a surgeon and not by the radiologist. So if you would like to perform parastomal hernia repair, you should also be able to uh, look on CT scan and to find the diagnosis by yourself without the uh, uh, radiologist or together with the radiologist, but not only by the radiologist. Sensitivity of... Oh, no. I'm sorry? As there was a raised hand, but it's already been taken down again. So, excuse me, please continue. I'm sorry. The sensitivity of CT and ultrasound was about 83%. So, the, uh, the authors concluded that CT is an accurate diagnostic modality, and it should be always used if you do a study with parastomal hernias. Concerning the um, classification. The, one of the oldest one is the radiological classification of Moreno Matias, which is also, uh, which is in my opinion, really very interesting. This is the type one. This is a subcutaneous prolapse in a hernia sac of uh, below five centimeters. This is a 1B uh, with a bigger sac of more than one, five centimeters. Type three is a subcutaneous prolapse and additionally prolapsed fatty tissue like omentum, uh, like omentomyus. Type three is stoma loop and other kind of intestine which is prolapsed through the dilated uh, crescent. And this is the normal aspect of a, of a stoma without any hernia or subcutaneous prolapse. The, the important thing is that the patients with the subcutaneous prolapse had, are symptomatic in about of 25%. And the patient with the type 2, that means a subcutaneous prolapse and also um, sub, uh, prolapse of any um, non-intestine um, intestine structures into the abdomen, into the um, hernia sac are a little bit, the, the frequency of the symptomatic patients are a little bit higher, but type three are almost in 90, are in almost 90% really symptomatic. So this seems to be quite a useful classification. Of course, the, hernia, the European Hernia Society, the classification of the European Hernia Society needs also um, be mentioned. It depends on the defect size, on the coexisting incisional hernia, and on the fact of recurrence or no. And type one is the parastomal hernia below five centimeters without incisional hernia, type two, small parastomal hernia with incisional hernia, type three, big parastomal hernia without incisional hernia, type four, big parastomal hernia with incisional hernia. And if you look uh, on the CT scan, this is type one, a small um, parastomal hernia without an incisional hernia. But if you look on these seven centimeters between the, um, between both rectus muscles, this will be, if you do a laparoscopy, this will be an incisional hernia as well. And this is, of course, a real incisional hernia, type, one, uh, type two, type three, type four. But 
this is quite, this is not a really good differentiation because if you have a, if you have a, a an open procedure before, you will find if you do laparoscopy in a lot of patients with small parastomal hernias, also an incisional hernia. When we talk about the um, the about the techniques repairing a parastomal hernia, one technique which is also used today is the keyhole technique, an incised mesh which is placed around the stoma loop and the incision is closed. Again, the keyhole technique was first laparoscopically described in the literature by um, Leblanc and it was really studied by uh, Bibi Hanson. And in the first paper, they described very promising results, but the, the um, observation period was only, the follow-up period was only a few weeks. And with the longer uh, follow-up period, they, uh, the, they saw a recurrence rate of about almost 40%, 70, 37% or something like that. So the keyhole technique is not a really sufficient technique, not in the intraperitoneal as well as, as in the extraperitoneal position. Although I know that in some cases, the keyhole technique may be the only technique which is also, um, which is possible in very desperate cases. And I will show you at the end uh, some of them. This is the laparoscopic modified sugar baker technique, which is uh, laparoscopically used today. It's, it's primarily described some years, ago, a lot of years ago, in an open uh, technique. And if you look on um, this technique, is uh, is the favorite technique of not of Bibi Hanson and um, the co-workers. And if you look here on the mesh, this is a Gore-Tex mesh, therefore you can, you can see it very nice. Here is the lateral part of the rectus muscle. And here's the stoma loop. And this is the lateralization of the stoma loop of perhaps maxim, at the maximum five centimeters. And if you look on this very small uh, amount of lateralization, you will understand that what we have realized with the, power, with the sugar baker technique in 2004. I will show you afterwards. In this paper, 2000, uh, uh, seven years ago, I'm sorry, seven years ago, 61 patients have been followed up for 26 months in four centers. That means, I'm sorry, that means um, that one center is treating about 15 patients in five years. That means three patients per, five patients per year. Um, the median follow-up was absolutely okay. Recurrence rate 6.6%. Concomitant incisional hernias 41%. In our series is much more. Post-operative morbidity 19%, which is absolutely okay. The laparoscopic sugar baker technique seems to be safe. Procedure was concluded by the authors. We started in uh, 99 with the sugar baker technique in a laparoscopic uh, in a laparoscopic approach and we finished it in 2004 and we uh, published these data a lot of years ago 41 patients according to sugar baker and 25 patients with the sandwich techniques we had eight recurrences following the sugar baker technique at that time no recurrence with the sandwich technique we had suspected infections which it was the time when we used uh, Gore-Tex uh, mesh and we were quite aggressive to remove the mesh. We had two re relaprotomies uh, due to ileus because of the sugar, uh, in the followed, following the sugar baker technique. We had two local revisions in these 25 patients um, because of a stenosis of the stoma loop 
in the level of the at the level of the fascia, not at the level of the mesh, at the level of the fascia. And I will show you it afterwards how it uh, works with that um, stenosis and one conversion. And when we looked why our results are not so promising with the sugar baker technique, we found that all these patients had a mainly lateral facial defect during the first repair of the parastomal hernia. And they all developed a, later, a lateral recurrence. Despite our efforts to really produce a big lateralization of five to seven in even more centimeters. And then I, um, we thought about how to prevent these lateral recurrence. And we thought that the combination of the keyhole mesh, which is stabilizing the lateral part with the sugar baker mesh, the so-called sandwich technique, may be successful. And in fact, this technique has been described in the late 90s by a German surgeon, Dr. Berliner from Berlin Buch. And I, 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 was, I was aware of that, uh, of that description when I first did the sandwich technique by myself, because until that point, I really did not recognize what he really did. And this is the, this is an animation showing the stoma loop, the midline incision, the keyhole mesh, which is closed by non-resorbable tucks or sutures, and the bigger um, sugar baker mesh covering not only the midline, but also lateralizing the, um, the stoma loop. And this is uh, the surgical repair in a very difficult patient. It was a lady with a rectal cancer and uh, they, she got a, a low anterior resection with a lot of complication and ended up with a, um, an endostomy of the descendants. And she had some um, severe adhesions during the procedure. The indication of the procedure was pain and evacuation problems. Um, of the stoma loop. And we needed about three to four hours for the uh, adhesiolysis, but finally it worked. This is the keyhole, tech, uh, the keyhole mesh, which is incised. The hole is very small, about two centimeters. And we use two stitches for closing, for closing uh, the incision, non-resorbable material, polypropylene, and this is the PVDF, uh, uh, PVDF suture. This is Dynamesh PVDF, uh, Dynamesh IPOM. And this hole can be adapted by using this kind, this, uh, this suture right here. We insert the, uh, the mesh into the, um, the abdominal wall. Here you see the lateral defect. And there was um, the, the, the stoma loop was fixed at the, lat fixed at the lateral defect in, in this lateral defect. And therefore, the patient had something like this, such a kinking. And this kinking was responsible for the evacuation problems and the pain. Now it's placed around the stoma loop. And here you see the difficult the difficulties after the adhesiolysis. So the lower part of the incision has no suture 
we cross it with the sutra parcel and then we grasp the sutras. And by grasping these sutras, you can adapt the whole, the diameter of the whole at the level of the stoma. And now the incision is furthermore closed with, uh, with non-resolvable tags. And we use for the keyhole mesh, which is usually a 15 by 15 centimeter mesh, but with bigger defects, it may be also 25 by 25, up to 25 by 25. We only use a few of these uh, tags fixing the keyhole mesh. In this case, the keyhole mesh is taped at the end. And without a further, uh, without a further step, without the sugar baker mesh, this will not be sufficient in the long run. This is the sugar baker mesh. This is the lower part, what you see right here, the lower part behind the uh, pubic bone. I always use uh, six stay sutures, two on the right and on the left side, and one in the midline uh, subsifoidally and um, one in the midline suprapubically. These are the midline sutures, which has been grasped um, at first. And now you, we have grasped the left, the lateral left sutures, subcoastally, as well as um, in the lower part, in the lower quadrant. And then we fix the mesh. We fix the mesh with the resolvable or non-resolvable text. And we made a, a funnel right here with a few tacks. And the problem, if you produce a um, if you produce a stenosis, is not when is not at the place where the stoma loop enters the abdominal cavity between the two meshes. It's at the facial level, because at the facial level the stoma comes down from the skin and then goes straight lateral. And this ankle may produce a stenosis if, you, if the, uh, the hole of the keyhole mesh is too narrow. We have done 100, this procedure in 114 patients, in patients with colostomies, ileostomies, as well as urological ostomies. Most of these patients, 80% had concomitant incisional hernias. That may be a problem of the definition. Median BMI of 29, median operating time 121 minutes, not always four to six hours like in this case. The median follow-up was uh, 36 months. And what we found was a clavia dindo between one and three A, complication rate of 16%, and more severe complications in almost 8%. Long-term morbidity have been recurrences in 4.4%, uh, reoperations in 2.6%, and subcutaneous prolapse, which sometimes persist after the procedure because I'm not really able to resolve the, the complete uh, subcutaneous prolapse in my technique at least. And six patients um, reported stoma care problems. The limitation of the laparoscopic sandwich technique 
is the subcutaneous prolapse, of course, because at least in my hands, I have problems to take these to take these prolapse down to mobilize the subcutaneous part of the stoma loop from lepro by laparoscopy. Very big defects in the parastomal region as well as if uh, when you have a very big incisional defect may be not suitable for the laparoscopic sandwich technique. The amount of adhesions of course but this is not the, usually not the problem. And another point, very important point, is the lateral stoma position. If you have a lateral stoma, you cannot adequately lateralize the stoma loop, and then you will have problems. You will you will get a, a, um, a recurrence due to a, a lateral growth of the defect. An alternative may be the technique described by Garnot Köhler with a 3D funnel-like mesh. This is the 2.5 centimeter funnel. This is the four centimeter funnel, two centimeters of diameter. And the group of Köhler published about 56 patients between three years treated laparoscopically with the same side soma relocation. That's the name given by that group. The outcome parameters, of course, intra postoperative surgical complications, recurrence rate, and the follow up of 38 months. The, the results can be summarized as really very promising reoperation rate of 9%, mostly done laparoscopically, recurrence rate of 12%. In conclusion, the authors uh, thought that this may be a very promising um, procedure with good long-term results and acceptable short-term complications. Another technique which is done by um, with the with the with the with the robot is primarily described by Pauli. And this is a point which I would like to really show you how it works. This is in a in a, a cadaver operation. Here is the stoma loop, uh, intra-abdominal. This is the retroperitoneal, uh, retromuscular uh, plane, sublay plane. This is the incision of the transversus muscle uh, in a sense of a transversus abdominis release, which is completed right here. At the end, it looks like this. The hole in the uh, peritoneum is closed, leading again to a lateralization of the stoma, as can be shown here. And this is fixed by a mesh. And if you do a sugar baker technique, these two sutures, no difference whether it's um, lapros done laparoscopically or open, these two sutures are the most important ones because they really lead to an adequate lateralization. And that's what you can see right here. This is the lateralization of the stoma loop. And Pauli described three patients with very promising results. However, the group of Rosen, which are, as you know, very experienced in doing transversus abdominis release, published 38 patients done in an open technique in two years. In the same technique, open TAR and reconstruction by Sugar Baker. They looked for wound morbidity, mesh related complications, and hernia recurrence with a very low follow up of only 13 months. And what they found was um, normal 30 day wound morbidity in the case of open surgery and transversus abdominis release. Recurrence rate of 11%, which may be acceptable in the, in the long run. But what is not acceptable is a mesh erosion, mesh erosion uh, problem in three cases, 8% at eight days, 12 days, and even 120 days post-operative. So the authors uh, proposed that this is not a procedure which should be generally used 
until further studies reveal that it can be done better by any changes or modifications of the technique. Therefore, if, as I, I heard a German surgeon two years ago talking about the, um, the Pauli procedure and describing the Pauli procedure as the gold standard of parastomal hernia repair, I don't think that we are at the moment in a position to really support that point of view. It's not the gold standard. It's a difficult procedure with relevant problems and it should be followed up uh, very strictly in order to exclude these problems described by the group of Rosen. What can we do with the parastomal hernia and a lateral stoma location? If the patient is satisfied with the stoma site, it's not necessary to relocate the stoma. And in that case, a local repair with a 3D fundal mesh, according to um, the technique of Gernot Köhler, may be very suitable. And I would always recommend to try it, uh, to try to do it laparoscopically, because the laparoscopic mesh placement is much more is much easier than the open, um, the open placement and the control of the placement of the mesh is really very effective laparoscopically. If the patient has problems with the stoma side, then of course a relocation may be uh, necessary again with a prophylactic intraperitoneal three-dimensional funnel mesh and a mesh-based repair of the original stoma cell. Again, I would always prefer laparoscopy. When you have very large facial defects, you have, and a parastomal hernia, you have two problems. You, first of all, you must reconstruct the abdominal wall. This is the primary aim. The abdominal wall must be anatomically reconstruct, and this reconstruct, uh, reconstruction must be safe and uh, long lasting. And in that case, is the only uh, procedure I know is the component separation technique using a synthetic non-resorbable mesh. And sometimes pre-treatment with uh, botulinum toxin may be really very helpful. I'm an absolute fan of the pre-treatment in the meantime and would always recommend in these cases uh, The relocation of the stoma is after stabilization of the uh, abdominal wall, the stoma needs relocation with an additional prophylactic mesh to uh, exclude any further uh, parastomal hernia or recurrent parastomal hernia. Another problem is a prop is the patient with Crohn's disease and a permanent stoma and parastomal hernia. What we have done since years is that in non-active diseases, no treatment since necessary since years, we treat these patients as we do uh, as we do it in non-Crohn patients with sandwich with 3D fundal, fundal mesh with intraperitoneal mesh. If you have an active disease, I would not recommend an intraperitoneal mesh. I think it's, this is not really proven, of course, but I think this is uh, common, surgical common sense. And I would use an extraperitoneal keyhole technique with a synthetic non-resorbable mesh. If somebody have, has other ideas, I would be very grateful to hear them because this is a big, Problem, active Crohn's disease and parastomal hernia. So when summarizing what I have shown, first of all, the incidence is high. The pathogenesis is a problem of the extracellular matrix, as it has been shown for the incisional hernia. And further factors, risk factors such as BMI, obesity, plays a role. Uh, for during the pathogenesis. Laparoscopic surgery is associated with a higher rate of parastoma, may be associated with a higher rate of parastoma. 
the hernia decreases the quality of life and therefore an effective repair is really necessary. And there are, um, there are uh, studies showing that after effective repair of parastomal hernia, the quality of life is increased again. Emergency procedures should urgently be avoided because they had a, quite a high morbidity and mortality and therefore watchful waiting may be dangerous for, for these patients. However, surgical therapy is, makes only sense if you have a safe and long lasting repair. The diagnosis should be done clinically and by ultrasound. Of course, sometimes it's necessary to use a CT scan as well uh, as it should be done in clinical studies. Yeah. For, for me, the standard procedures are sugar baker technique, sandwich technique, or 3D funnel techniques. I prefer the sandwich techniques, of course. Lap done laparoscopically. The retraperitoneal sugar baker technique, according to Pauli, should be strictly followed in order to exclude these described severe complications. Large defects should be treated primarily by a reconstruction of the abdominal wall and um, relocation of the stoma with a further prophylactic mesh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Berger. Shall we go for the first round of questions before we switch to the case studies? Are there any questions? Yeah, there are some questions in the chat already. Um, so first of all, from Hakan Gerk, what is your opinion regarding parastomal hernia defect closure? Um, in fact, I don't close the parastomal hernia defect, although uh, the literature uh, dealing with laparoscopic repair of incisional hernia um, shows in the meantime that it may be helpful and it may be better to close the defect. At the moment, I think about closing the defect, but I don't do it at the moment. And these 114 patients have not, the, the defects in these 140 patients have not been closed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a question from Ahmed al Wusaibi that was asked during your um, sandwich technique uh, video, what type of mesh do you use? I use the, uh, since 2004, the um, DynaMesh iPom, which is, um, which is a, a PVDF mesh, a mesh by polyvinylidane fluorid, and um, with a small amount of polypropylene on the parietal side in order to induce quite um, um, adhesion or incorporation into the abdominal wall. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question from Hakan Gak. What's your MIS recommendation for repairing both parastomal hernia and incisional hernia? Um, a sandwich technique, of course. You can do it by sugar baker, but <clears throat> the problem with the sugar baker is that is the lateral part of the abdominal wall, and it's quite difficult to decide intraoperatively when you do laparoscopy, is it really a lateral uh, defect or is it more only a medial defect? If it's only a medial defect, you use a big sugar baker mesh, but you are on the safe side if you use a sandwich technique with a keyhole, a uh, small key or, or a 15 by 15 centimeter usually, uh, 15 by 15 centimeter keyhole technique and then a big sugar baker mesh covering the midline. I always cover the midline if I have a patient after open procedures. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question from Juan Ruiz Lopez. Uh, what about extra prosthetic material when you use the sandwich technique versus the sugar baker or the 3D funnel? 
extract prosthetic material um what does it mean extra prosthetic material i'm sorry a double mesh uh, another mesh yeah a cheaper mesh, a cheaper mesh for keyhole and the, <laughs> the expensive mesh for sugar paper. That, that may be possible, of course. If you cover, if you use a polypropylene mesh, for example, as for the keyhole, um, I think you can use it if you can completely cover that mesh with the sugar baker mesh. But in fact, this is not always possible. And therefore, I would recommend to use two meshes which are really um, allowed for intraperitoneal use. Um, sorry, there's a clarification from Mr. Lopez. No, I mean he is using one mesh as keyhole plus a second mesh for covering colon. Uh, so I, I think the question is, are you concerned about the extra material when you use the sandwich technique as opposed to Ah, a single ah, yeah, mesh okay. use in a sugar baker okay. or the 3D funnel. I'm sorry. Okay. No, I'm I'm not concerned about the 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 amount of uh, foreign material in the abdominal cavity. Not at all. We have done it in these cases, and we have we have not seen any mesh related complications. Okay. Very good. I hope this answered your question, Mr. Lopez. Thanks. We can we can talk another time about the role of lap ipom and the danger of intraperitoneal meshes, which is discussed in the last years in a quite unscientific way or uh, manner. And but this is not uh, this is not a problem of today, I think, because you can talk about this problem uh, for hours. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, I think for the time being, there are no questions at the moment. So if it's okay for you, we could switch to the case studies now. Yeah. I'm sorry. The first patient, 78 years old, BMI 33. The patient had a conventional APR due to cardiorectal carcinoma and adjuvant radiochemotherapy. At that time, the preoperative radiochemotherapy was obviously not generally used in Germany. He developed the parastomal hernia after one year. And during the first years, there was no progression, but in the last years until the repair, there was a, quite a progression and the, uh, the hernia was growing and the patient had pain and or described pain and described really severe and disabling stoma care problems. And that's what, what we see in the CT scan about seven centimeters of defect between the medial part of the rectus muscle and the lateral part of the abdominal wall. And you don't see any rectus muscle right here. So it's quite a lateral um, stoma loop with a lot of, uh, a lot of intestine in the uh, hernia. In the lower part of the hernia sac, uh, in the lower part of the defect, it's even bigger. The defect is even bigger. And again, the midline, the midline is not really stable. This is a patient with a, an additional incisional hernia. So what would you propose to do? The patient was quite happy with the, uh, with the stoma side. So He's, he mentioned that it would not be really necessary to relocate the stoma. If it's necessary, we can do it, but he was quite satisfied with the stoma sound. What would you propose? This is a question for the audience, so feel free to raise your hands or <laughs> write your suggestions.
okay, I decided is it was one one surgical procedure um, ending up in the parastomal hernia, and therefore I decided to do a laparoscopic repair by the sandwich technique. Sugar baker technique may be possible. The open procedures, of course, has a higher frequency of wound complications and probably a higher recurrence rate. But there is one problem, and that should be really pointed out for the let for the sugar baker technique or the sandwich technique, the lateralization of the stoma loop, which fortunately was the lateralization was achieved right here. In this part, you can, with some um, difficult adhesiolysis, you can really, I'm sorry, you can really lateralize the stoma loop for five to six centimeters. But this is really limited. The lateralization is limited for the, um, in this case of lateral stoma. And therefore I, I look for, I present this, uh, this patient, it may be possible as well, not it may be possible, it is absolutely possible as well, and it's also a good idea to stabilize the abdominal wall right here and to do a relocation with a prophylactic mesh, but always, of course, with a prophylactic mesh in the right lower quadrant. There's a question on uh, this study, I believe. Um, how about restoma in another place? Yeah, that is a good idea, but always with a prophylactic mesh. If you, if you, um, if you relocate the stoma in a patient with a parastomal hernia, it's absolutely necessary and to, to use a prophylactic mesh. And I would say it's really a mistake if you do it without a prophylactic mesh. But of course, this is a good idea. And it was absolute the limitation of the of the uh, of the sandwich or sugar bacon. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I agree with Restoma with a prophylactic mesh. Um, next patient, 43 years old, BMI 20, 28. He has a severe ulcerative colitis since years, and um, he was. Um, Adequate, absolutely adequately treated with aggressive uh, conservative therapy, including antibodies and so on. And uh, in 2010, he got an open proctocolectomy and idle pouch anal anastomosis and a loop ileostomy. After this procedure, the patient was absolutely happy with the loop ileostomy and the ileostomy was not taken down. He developed the parastomal hernia. And in 2015, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the in the primary hospital, which has also done the um, proctocolectomy, a suture repair was performed. <clears throat> and as expected, the recurrent hernia occurs quite early after the hospital stay. The, the parastomal hernia was painful, was progressive, and produced stoma care problems. And the patient want to, wanted to, um, to have a treatment of the parastomal hernia, but he refuses to take down the stoma. And this is the right lower quadrant. And here you see a lot of, um, a lot of small intestine in the subcutaneous tissue in the hernia sac. This is the defect in the other direction. So what would you propose to do? Okay. We converted the loop ileostomy to an end ileostomy because the patient refused to get the pouch out. A 
pouch with a stoma in front of the pouch is not a really good idea because these patients will develop problems with the pouch. But the patient could not really accept to, uh, to, to be freed by his pouch. And therefore, we did a conversion of the loop to an end ileostomy, a modified Hartman situation. And we re-implanted the stoma, the end stoma with a prophylactic three-dimensional mesh overlapping also the midline and stabilizing the original lacrotomy according to the to the um, to the procedure of Gernot Köhler. Unfortunately the patient developed a recurrent hernia after two years and the reason of the recurrence was a dilated and a dilated keyhole and a completely disappeared funnel. We use the funnel with 2.5 centimeters. And if you, it's, it's uh, elastic and you can, you can pull through also quite obese mesentery, uh, uh, the stoma loop, stoma loop with quite obese mesentery. And then you extend your funnel, but the funnel will shorten. And in the long run, after two years, the funnel was completely disappeared in, the, in this cases in this case and the ring was even dilated so that the patient developed a recurrent hernia and we converted now this problem uh, in a sandwich technique using a 15 by 15 centimeter keyhole mesh and a larger sugar baker mesh and since that time the patient has no this was in 2000 17, yet January 2017, and since that time the patient is uh, satisfied. Okay, this is the IPSD, the prophylactic mesh, which should be mainly used in or exclusively used with a diameter of two centimeters because it's elastic and in the length the length of the funnel should be four centimeters this is the same one with uh, which can be seen in the uh, in the mri the next patient 58 years old quite obese he had also an abdominal an apr due to carcinoma after neoadjuvant therapy and he had nine surgical procedures due to parastomal hernias the most recent one took place in 2011. The stoma was relocated in all quadrants without any prophylactic attempts. Nine procedures of paras due to parastomal hernias without any prophylactic mesh was done. Actually, the stoma at that time was in the right upper quadrant. He had a symptomatic and progressive parastomal hernia with stomach care problems. And in the last report, very severe adhesions um, have been described. And adhesiolysis was at that time almost not possible. So uh, they did only a local repair with a suture. What would you recommend in such a case? I need help. <laughs> well, this is the case. This is the, um, the stoma, which is the colon. This is the colon. The rest of the colon. This is the CT scan. The defect between the medial and the lateral part of the rectus and a lot of bowel inside, just inside the hernia sac, the liver, of course. So a lot of colon. We have used this kind of mesh, which, is, which can be used extra peritoneally, which is in a keyhole mesh, which is incised with a small 
a very short funnel. And we placed it, we prepared only pre-peritoneal in a, with a restricted transvasal subdominis release in order to get a um, adequate lateral um, augmentation of the abdominal wall. And we used that kind of mesh, the EPST mesh. And uh, we closed the abdomen, we closed the defect, of course. We took down the prolapsed uh, stoma, uh, the prolapsed uh, intestine. We closed the defect and we augmented the abdominal wall with a bigger EPST mesh. And we had quite an ideal course during a few years, but actually the patient had subcutaneous prolapse with some symptoms. Uh, symptoms uh, impaired stoma care, which is a bigger, which is a little bit a problem. And therefore the subcutaneous prolapse may be uh, treated in the next time by a local approach. Okay. There is a comment again on, on this uh, repair. Um, you can also repair with one mesh in onlay position and fixation of the abdominal in a wall in the corset as a recommendation for the future. Well, I'm not a fan of onlay meshes. I always try to, um, to fix the meshes um, behind the muscle layers. And therefore the combination of a preperitoneal approach uh, and um, very limited um, uh, transversus abdominis release in order to get lateral uh, stabilization of the abdominal wall is for me the preferred technique compared with an onlay technique. The open onlay has been shown by a, a review of Bibi Hanson has is not really producing very promising results. I would not recommend an onlay. You can prepare um, preperitoneally, usually also in these patients with very severe intra-abdominal adhesions. adhesions. Okay, that was all the comments for the okay. time being. The last patient was a female patient, uh, very long history, starting with perianal pain, anism. She had multiple anal surgery, resulting finally in a severe incontinence, and she ended in an end colostomy. After that, she had a lot of surgeries due to hernias, never using a prophylactic mesh. We saw the patient when she had an ascendostoma in the right lower quadrant with a parastomal hernia. And um, again, in these, in the last, uh, the last uh, reports described very severe adhesions. And therefore, again, these patients got only a suture repair, repair from outside because the surgeons did not um, did not um, get access to the abdominal to the abdominal cavity, and therefore we tried. We decided to treat the hernia again with, the, as described before, with the EPST mesh in 2015, and the patient had a few months later, half a year later, again, recurrent episodes of evacuation problems and hospitalizations due to um, episodes like ileus. And this is the CT scan. Here you can see the mesh. Yeah, and this is the CT scan with a really pronounced subcutaneous prolapse of the um, stoma loop. What would you propose to do? No proposal? <laughs> okay. We did a local revision and um, 
the problem of the disturbed evacuation seems to be caused by the subcutaneous prolapse. And therefore, we decided to take down the subcutaneous prolapse. We did a local revision. We mobilized the subcutaneous part of the ascendostoma. We shortened it and reconstructed the stoma at the same side. And that was quite effective from 2016 until um, end of last year. And now the lady again has a recurrent subcutaneous prolapse. We, at that time of, at, that at the time of that procedure, we prepared until the mesh and we found no real hernia, no real, um, no other uh, parts of the intestine prolapsing. It was only the subcutaneous prolapse. And therefore we thought that it may be um, adequate to only shorten the stoma loop. But um, probably we should use now in this case, uh, laparotomy with complete adhesiolysis and reconstruction of the stoma with um, 3D fundal mesh. I think this is the only um, the only possibility to to solve this severe problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We do have a few more questions. Um, let's say general questions, um, starting with Yuchel. Uh, Cengiz, will you please tell us a little more about the kinking problem when lateralizing the stoma at the parastomal hernia repair? The kinking problem is always a problem in this of the subcutaneous tissue, at least in our uh, of the subcutaneous region, at least in our experience. The people people who are surgeons who look in in who who visited in our um, OR and uh, in order to see the, the the sandwich repair, they are also always worried. They were always worried about the fact that the sugar baker mesh may producing a kinking or an ankle of the stoma loop. But this is not the problem. The problem is always located in the at the level of the facial level. If the if you have a subcutaneous prolapse, as it has been shown also in this patient here, it, the, the, sub, the stoma loop enters the skin, goes lateral, and goes medial. And if, goes, if you do a sandwich technique, it goes lateral again. And this is the point where the stenosis occurs, not here when it enters the abdominal cavity when it when it's leaving the uh, the space between the two meshes the facial level is the problem because it comes from lateral and then it goes lateral again and if you have this problem you have only to shorten your from a local repair you can shorten the uh, the stoma loop to go straight upwards and you won't have any problem won't have any problem anymore and in order to prevent that problem is you should always palpate with your finger deep down into the abdominal cavity. If you reach the facial level with your finger and you can, with your finger, you can also reach this part of the, of the uh, stomach loop. You won't have any problems. If you don't reach the um, the facial level, you can immediately in the same session do a re um, uh, um, revision of the a local revision of the stoma and shorten it and uh, uh, reconstruct it. Or if the patient has problems with evacuation during the first two three days, then you should do it at that time. Please do not wait until nine or 10 days or 12 days as we have done in the first case when we learned that problem. But uh, at the best thing is to do it 
immediate during immediately during the first procedure and the, the second uh, the second possibility which is almost no major problem to do it after a few days okay thank you very much um, Further question from Ian Donkin, which technique would you recommend for repair of peristomal hernia associated with a centrally placed ileal conduit? It is difficult to place a mesh using the sugar baker technique due to the mesentery and ureters being quite central, making lateralization quite difficult. Well, I, um, the ileum conduit is sometimes has a specific problem because some or, or urologists prefer an extra peritoneal placement of uh, an extra peritoneal root of the stoma loop. And that should be, you should, you should always keep in mind that this may be possible. Um, and in fact, the ileum conduit should be at least 30 cent, should be, should have at least 30 centimeter at length. And therefore, in my experience with these few ileum conduits, it was always possible to do a sandwich technique. I had no problems with this, with uh, lateralization. In fact, um, the mesentery of the um, of the ileum may be shortened, especially in patients with. Um, Crohn's disease, or even after ulcerative ulcerative colitis, because of the intra-abdominal obesity, that may be sometimes difficult. But I had not these problems uh, in patients with ileum conduits. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. And for the time being, the last question, as it looks like. Uh, from Juan Ruiz Lopez. Um, in your opinion, would a 3D funnel mesh be the appropriate prophylactic mesh? Well, I, we have we have used that mesh in 165 cases with very very good and promising results. And for me, that's that's the only mesh I use in, for prophylactic purposes. I always use it since 2006. The mesh was available, is available since 2006, and we have used it in, in these patients, in these amount of patients, very successfully. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the audience? Mr. Duncan and Mr. Ruiz, thank you for, for your answer. Okay, I believe if there's no further questions for the time being, then I would like to thank you, Professor Berger, for this excellent lecture and the interesting case studies you showed us today. Um, I would like, on behalf of Dynamesh, thank everyone who participated today. Um, have a good start into the week. Stay safe and I hope we see you next time. Thank you very much. Also um, from me, it was a great opportunity and it was an honor to talk about parastoma hernia. Thank you very much for, the, for this possibility. We are the ones who have to thank. Okay, then I will finish this webinar session for today. Again, take care and we hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.